got started, I took a peek on HydroShare, and there are 17 uh, public resources with the keyword GISWR2018. So that means 17 of you collectively between uh, Utah State and Texas have done the right thing. They, if you did not put this keyword GISWR2018 or if your resource is not public, I would not have found it. But uh, it's great to see all these there, and I'll be going and checking on the Utah State uh, term project proposals uh, either tomorrow or over the weekend, given that the deadline is uh, sort of midnight tonight. Uh, so. You're not late yet, but uh, looking forward to reading the proposals. Any questions related to either the term project or uh, how to load it and how to share anything like that? Questions? Everybody looks good here. David? Okay. So um, today we are going to talk about uh, spatial analysis using grids. So we've seen... Uh, Mention of grids or mention of rasters uh, a fair bit in the course up to date, but uh, we haven't really delved into the details. We've delved a bit into the details of uh, geographic features and associated tables. And today we're going to sort of go quite deeply into how gridded data is represented in GIS. So the objectives uh, that are at the end of this class, you should be able to describe the ways continuous surface or spatial, spatial field information is represented in GIS. You should uh, know what the elements of the grid data structure are. Um, you should be able to uh, describe how integer, categorical, or real value data is represented using a grid. Um, you should be able to use map algebra to perform raster calculations on grids. and um, know some of the issues involved, specifically uh, the resolution or scale issues. Um, you should know at least what interpolation is and some of the considerations involved in using different interpolation uh, mechanisms. Um, it says use uh, interpolation to determine the watershed average precipitation, but that'll be covered in, in the exercise. And then you should be able to calculate the slope of a topographic surface. Uh, represented by a grid. So we'll focus on uh, different ways of uh, calculating slope because firstly it's an important quantity in hydrology and it uh, also allows you to uh, do some sort of quantitative analysis uh, with GIS. So there's quite a number of slides here about readings that uh, I'd like you to look at to sort of get the background. This first link uh, takes you to the ArcGIS help just really defining what's raster data. And if you look at the bottom left here, you'll see that uh, I've put the red boxes around what I think you should read. So for this one, you only have to read the first thing, what is uh, raster data. So if you follow that link, we uh, get into this section. And it really just explains uh, the concepts of raster data, raster base maps, representing elevation, things like that. Um, there's a second set of uh, pages on the, on the help set that refers to the sort of fundamentals of raster data. And that one I'd like you to read the first six, starting from cell size of raster data down to raster data set attributes. It keeps on going with other subjects that you don't necessarily need to worry about, uh, at least for this class. So if you go to that link, uh, you're on the cell size of raster data one, and uh, read uh, this entirety. You'll see that this slide is one I'll show, I'll show and talk about this picture later on. Um, and you get down to uh, raster data set attribute tables, which we've already encountered a little bit with the national land cover data sets uh, in the last exercise. So we'll learn a bit more about how that works. Um, so then, um, those were more or less theory about how uh, rasters work. And if you notice, those were actually help pages associated with ArcMap or the sort of desktop version. If you're using ArcGIS Pro, which all of you guys are, there is this link here, which uh, leads you to the spatial analyst toolbox that we'll uh, 
we'll work with. And I just want you to read this to get an overview of some of the things available. So I don't think you need to read, all, read about all of the tools because they're quite extensive, but just get a general sense of the sort of things that are available that you could look into learning about if you needed to, say, for your term project or, or future work. We're going to be using things like slope, aspect, contour uh, from the zonal tool, or from the surface tool set, from the zonal tool set, we'll do zonal statistics as we later on in the class. Um, today we'll uh, see uh, the raster calculator that's part of map algebra. Um, then in terms of uh, the specific quantities of slope and aspect, now slope is how steep the ground is, aspect is quantifying the direction it goes, is it sloping to the north or sloping to the south? Um, and you can read about them on, uh, on these links. Um, and then we've also got a handout, and uh, we probably should have updated this. We did put this on the, uh, the 2018 website, but somehow this one uh, forgot to get updated. Um, so that this, is a, this is a handout that goes into uh, more details about um, how slope is, uh, is calculated. And I'll touch on some of that. Yeah. Can I say yeah. something here, David? Can you go back to the previous one? Go ahead. Can you go back to the previous? Yeah, so I wrote this handout quite a while ago, and it was, was the idea of um, pointing out a, a basic distinction between um, slope, which is calculated between two points, like these are ben benchmarks on our campus, actually, and <coughs> then slope as it's defined by uh, having a continuous surface and taking a derivative of it, which is largely what we're going to do inside the GIS system. So, uh, yeah, here we go. Um, so when we normally think about slope, it's in terms of, I'm, I'm just drawing a line and I'm taking the regular delta x, delta y, delta z and figuring out slope as a rise over run and that kind of thing. And so what we're doing in this class is a more sophisticated idea of slope which has to do with um, look both at, uh, amplitude and direction being defined on a, on a curved surface. And so Dr. Tarbin is going to mainly get into that, but I thought to introduce this, uh, these ideas here so that you, know, you can kind of go from where you're probably familiar with to something that's you know, you're familiar with, but perhaps a bit less so. Uh, there's all the, I guess, nine pages of details you can learn yeah. about that. <laughs> so that's a fair bit of reading, but uh, good stuff. So um, there's really two fundamental ways of uh, representing uh, geographic objects uh, in, in a GIS type system. Uh, the first is uh, as discrete objects, and the second is as fields. Uh, so the discrete object view of uh, things is that uh, you have objects that have well-defined boundaries, such as points, lines, uh, polygons, and we represent these with uh, features, uh, often with shapefiles or uh, feature data sets or feature classes in a geodatabase. On the other hand, the field view of the world represents uh, whatever it is you're interested in as a uh, variable or a finite number of variables, a quantity that's defined at each possible position. So that would be used for representing, uh, say, an elevation surface or a temperature surface or a precipitation surface, where you can go to any location, you can say, this is what the elevation is, this is what the precipitation was over such and such a time period. So uh, that's a continuous surface, and it's more natural to represent continuous surfaces with uh, rasters, with grids that have a certain cell size, whereas it's more natural to represent discrete objects uh, with features. So uh, if you're thinking of a spatial surface, you might have something that's uh, some topography over here. You can represent it as a grid or a raster, which is this uh, thing shown on the right, where you have elevation values that uh, on, a, on a sort of regular posting, grid cells here and here and here. And um, you record the grid values, and that's the numerical approximation of the continuous surface. You could also represent it with uh, contours if you work with uh, topographic maps, you've probably seen contours, and you could actually add to the contour representation 
flow lines that are perpendicular to the contours, and you've, then you've got a sort of hydrologically oriented representation of a surface. You could also uh, represent it with what's known as a triangulated irregular network, or TIN, where you have points that are irregular over the space. You construct triangles between the points, and there's mechanisms for doing that. Uh, sometimes well, Delaney triangulation is one of the common uh, methods. And then you think of each uh, location um, falling within a triangle. Once you're within the triangle, you can pin one corner of the triangle. If you pin the second corner of the triangle, you've still got movement. But if you pin three corners of a triangle, you've got a plane that's fixed. You can then interpolate to wherever that uh, point is and get the exact uh, value of whatever that surface is. So triangulated irregular net networks is, is another way. Today, we're just focusing on uh, the grid representation. Um, so this shows the sort of mapping between uh, the vector approach, which has points, lines, and polygons, and the raster approach, which approximates a point as a single cell, a line as a sequence of cells, and a polygon as, uh, as a zone of cells. So when you're starting to represent things in uh, in a grid or raster representation. Um, and I use the words grid and raster more or less interchangeably. Um, grid probably comes more from uh, the engineering matrix type world, and raster is the term that's often used in, in GIS. Um, but you, you, you introduce an approximation in that uh, the, whatever the cell size is, is the, the finest. Uh, level of uh, representation you can give. So here are a number of examples. You might have lines that may represent rivers become represented as uh, a sequence of grid cells. You might have polygons that represent different types of land use, and they get uh, represented as uh, polygon features within the, within the raster representation. Um, so there's uh, two methods, uh, as I pointed out, in terms of uh, representing geographic information. Uh, and both represent in different ways to encode and generalize. So the term generalize in the GIS context means approximating something that may have a lot of detail at a level of resolution that's appropriate for the description and scale you're using. Both can be used to encode both fields and discrete objects, because we saw here that the polygons were discrete objects. Here they were approximated um, as using a, a grid. Um, but in practice, there's a strong association between uh, raster and fields and vector and discrete objects. So um, now this is going to. Uh, talk a bit about uh, how things are represented with a grid. So a grid defines geographic space as a mesh of identically uh, sized square grid cells, and each holds a numerical value that measures some geographic attribute. Elevation is the most common one we'll work with in this class, but uh, don't limit yourself to thinking of grids as representing elevations. They represent temperature, they represent land cover, they represent uh, all sorts of things. Um, so the data structure involved is that a grid is defined by its extent, uh, where it starts and where it ends, the spacing or the cell size. You may have a no data value to represent uh, that you may don't have data over the whole domain represented by the grid. You need to know the number of rows and the number of columns, and you need to know where it's positioned in space so in terms of the um, some sort of corner, the top left, uh, bottom right coordinates, or the coordinates of uh, a corner location. You can have grid values that are real numbers, floating decimal point numbers, 3.1416, for example, or you could have integer numbers uh, that may represent uh, either integer valued quantities or uh, some lookup into an attribute table that gives. Uh, a classification. So we saw last class with land cover, I think there was a value of 11 that mapped into, uh, into water. 
if I'm remembering it. Mm -hmm. So this shows uh, how you may have data over part of the domain, and then some of it will be filled with uh, no data cells. Um, this shows a network of uh, grid cells. Uh, so this is my, how we may represent a stream network. And we may use different uh, numerical values uh, to represent each uh, stream segment. And then we'd have a, some sort of a lookup table that relates that to the attributes of those streams. Um, as an example of uh, a uh, floating point grid where there's numerical values that might represent uh, the amount of rainfall at each uh, grid cell. This is a set of integer value grids to represent zones that may represent uh, land cover or uh, urbanization, something like that. And once, if you have an integer value grid, you can have the value attributed table. So here you've got the individual values 1, 2, and 3 that map onto things like, uh, in this case, uh, different types of tree, uh, maybe some encoding that's used for them, uh, and how many of them there are. So we saw when we were looking at the um, National Land Cover data set in the example in the last exercise, there was a count of the number of grid cells associated with each land cover class when we uh, were looking at that. Um, with this slide, I wanted to just uh, have you think about um, what does the value in a grid cell actually mean? Um, because depending on what it is, it might actually be interpreted differently. Um, so this comes from uh, a uh, sort of core curriculum uh, developed for, for GI science. Um, and one option is for the grid value to represent a value right at the center or a value that's averaged over the grid cell. So if you've got a grid cell that's maybe uh, 30 meters, uh, you might have a slope across that grid cell. Maybe the elevation is an average within that 30 meter cell. Uh, maybe it's a value sampled right at the center as a point. And you can imagine if the surface is irregular, the values at the point might be different than, than the average. So when you're looking at any data, you really need to know a bit about what the interpretation of that value is to, to use it properly. Sometimes, but not very often in GIS, the values are actually at the, the nodes, not at the centers of the grid cells. Um, we don't work with that very often because the node option is really just shifting the, the grid option by, by half a cell, and then you get at the center. And um, with the grids that we deal with in ArcGIS, there's always the same number of rows and columns as the data value, so the, the center interpretation or the average interpretation is uh, usually much better. Um, there's also questions of uh, the size of the grid cells and therefore how well you can represent something or um, the question of generalization. So perhaps we've got a polygon here that might represent some sort of a mustardy, dirty lake. It would be nicer if it was blue, but you can see this, this one came from the ArcGIS help that I showed you earlier, and they, they were using this yellow color or orange color. Um, if you've got a, a fairly small uh, grid size, you can represent it fairly well, as this first one shows. So smaller size, higher resolution, higher feature spatial accuracy. Because there's more grid cells involved, it's slower to display. Any calculation is slower, and you've got larger files that you have to move around. On the other end of the spectrum, you might have larger grid cells. You can see that you've got an approximation of what's going on, or a generalization of what's going on. Larger cell size, lower resolution, lower accuracy, but faster display, faster processing. So there's always this trade-off as to uh, how um, finely you represent the data versus uh, the sort of processing capability. And you might say, well, we always want it as fine as we can possibly get, but uh, then if your computer is crunching and crunching and crunching for uh, hours or days, you need to make it a bit coarser. And sometimes the data doesn't really support going too fine. Um, so other things to think about in terms of generalization is what is the rule that's used to, to go from, say, a vector representation to the equivalent raster? Do you look at uh, just the middle of the grid cell? So that's what I've got here with the central point rule. 
in this example, the middle of the grid cell is actually in the, in the white space, so it would get colored in white. Or do you somehow say, what is the majority of the grid cell? That might be some sort of a averaging. In this case, you would get that. So uh, think about that. When you've got raster data, what is the sort of uh, generalization rule that's being used? And um, because you might, get, you might get different answers. Um, there's another really powerful thing we can do with uh, raster data, and that's we can start doing uh, mathematical calculations. And that falls under the name of map algebra or a raster calculation. So there's a map algebra toolbox in ArcGIS, which has one tool in it that's called raster calculator. So at some level, map algebra and raster calculator are a little bit synonymous, but I think they put the map algebra tool there in anticipation that they may have other types of tools go into it. Um, so uh, you could, for example, have precipitation over a grid. You, maybe you want to subtract the losses due to evaporation and in infiltration, and the difference is, is runoff. So you can do that for each cell. The top left cell here has value of 5 for precipitation, minus 3 for the losses would give you a runoff of 2. 6 minus 3 is 3. So you can evaluate things on a cell-by-cell -cell basis, and you can actually frame a raster calculation to do that on an entire grid. You just push the button run, and if you've got uh, a million grid cells, it'll chunk, or it'll, it'll compute for a little while, uh, but it'll give you the answer, um, and there you've done a, a massive calculation pretty quickly. So that's one of the sort of powerful things to that you can actually do, um, but we'll look at some of the subtleties involved. Um, so this just expands on that example a little bit as to sort of put it in a, in a more practical context. You may have precipitation, say, from radar. You may have soil and land use data. You may have a runoff <coughs> grid that's uh, been calculated from uh, those, whatever the raster calculations are for how you get runoff from rainfall. Perhaps you implementing uh, some sort of a hydrologic uh, model, um, whatever the runoff formula is, then you get your runoff. And then you might want to then accumulate that as the water flows down the topography to see what the flow is in the rivers. And we'll be working with uh, the accumulation functions on rasters quite a lot. But there are subtleties. As I mentioned, what happens if the grids are not the same size. Maybe one has a cell size of 100 meters, the other one has a cell size of 150 meters. As it turns out, you can put those both into ArcGIS, tell it to do this plus that, and it gives you an answer. And I'm asking you to think about what answer you expect it to give you if these cells don't perhaps align right. What answer should it give you and I want you to think about that because there's always a temptation to say, oh, I've got this, do this, I'll do that. I'll do a raster calculation. And maybe it's not doing exactly uh, what you want. So you need to think about the analysis extent, the cell size, and maybe you only want your calculations within a, in a certain area. So um, here I'm putting that in terms of a specific example. Um, we've got precipitation and infiltration, and I've made up these numbers and said, let's assume precipitation is on a 150 meter grid. Infiltration rate, we've calculated, we've got on a 100 meter grid, and the equation that we're dealing with is runoff is precipitation minus uh, infiltration. So this is a sort of a, a little bit oversimplified example, because in a real hydrology calculation, you'd probably have the infiltration rates uh, changing as the soil gets wetter, perhaps using uh, some sort of infiltration model. But I wanted to focus on the sort of geospatial aspect of it uh, rather than the, the hydrological aspect of it. Um, so I was going to experiment with that in ArcGIS. So you can actually take uh, this uh, representation of precipitation 4, 6, 3.1, and 4 with a cell size of 150, you can represent it in a file that says that there's two rows and two columns. 
I'm just arbitrarily putting the corner at zero, zero. I'm saying what the cell size is. The no data value I'm saying is minus 9999. There aren't any no data values in this case. And I'm putting the numbers on a, on a grid, 463.14. So this is actually an ASCII file <coughs> that you can uh, work with in ArcGIS. And here's the equivalent one for, um, for infiltration. So if you go to the class web page, um, you'll see I actually uh, put a little zip file here, raster.zip, and that's the data that I'm about to show. So I downloaded that before the class. So inside this uh, downloads folder is the raster example zip file, and inside that there's these two files, precip dot ASCII and infiltration dot ASCII. And if I open this, say, with a, some sort of a text editor, um, like Notepad, I see the, uh, might be hard to read on the screen, but I see the, the files exactly as I had on the slide. So this is one way uh, you could actually create uh, raster data and work with an ArcGIS. You could just uh, type out a file like this or uh, import it from whatever programming you are into this format. You can edit these numbers. So just as we saw uh, last time how you can uh, create a table and then create feature data, this would be a way to uh, create raster data. So I'm going to go, so I opened ArcGIS Pro beforehand and I've got an empty map here and I'm going to add data and find that, which I guess is in my downloads folder in raster example and uh, let's load uh, each of these uh, just as rasters. So um, it's now been added um, eventually. We might ask, where in the world is that going to be? And we've got the, the base map here showing uh, the US and the world topographic map. The origin I'd set for these was just zero, zero. So it's actually going to go uh, at wherever the zero, zero of the, the coordinates are, which is going to be in the in the ocean somewhere. So I'm going to um, get rid of the, uh, the base map information because that's not really relevant for this uh, study. And I'm just going to um, zoom to uh, one of these layers. And you can see that there's uh, yeah, these numerical values. Maybe I want to uh, change the symbology a little bit to uh, some sort of a color scheme that uh, looks a bit diff looks a bit perhaps more attractive, and I can look at the values and see. Okay, this has got the precipitation value of four. This is the precipitation value of three point one. There's the precipitation value of four. So that's the data that I I created. So now uh, I guess the infiltration is uh, is similar, but it's on the three by by three grids, so these uh, cells don't line up perfectly. So now I'm going to do the calculation that says precipitation minus infiltration to try and figure out the runoff. And to do that, I'm going to go into uh, the toolboxes. And where do I find tool toolboxes? I actually want to go load, uh, load tools here. Um, and I can go to toolboxes. If I knew uh, what the name of the tool was, I could actually type it in there, but I'm also just going to use it to show you where it is in the toolboxes. You can find the spatial analyst tool. So I remember I gave you the help page to look at about spatial analyst. If you expand that, there's a whole bunch of... Uh, the wrong one, spatial statistics, spatial analyst. There's a whole bunch of tools. Uh, there, for example, is a hydrology one we'll work with a fair bit later on. We're also going to work with uh, some of the surface ones and zonal ones. Surface lets you, let you plot contours, and zonal ones let you average over areas. But I'm going to go to the map algebra one where there's the single tool raster calculator. 
So I'm going to open that tool, and uh, I'm going to say I want to do precipitation, so I double-click on it, minus uh, infiltration. So um, I'm now effectively in this little box here calculate, setting up a map algebra expression. It's fairly simple, but you could put um, whatever complex expression that you want in here that's going to operate on whatever rasters you have in your, um, in your map. So it's fairly powerful uh, in terms of uh, actually doing, doing analysis. And I'm going to save the results um, back in the same folder where I was working. So I'm just going to uh, click on that, go back to my download. I could put it in the geodatabase, um, but I'm going to just put it here. And I'm going to call this result here runoff. Um, there's actually a convention that ArcGIS uses if you, uh, put a, um, if you put a file name without an extension, it uses the ESRI grid format, which is a, a common format. If I put .tiff, it would use a geotiff format, which is a format that I'm actually quite uh, partial to because touting works with that by default. But this one I'm going to go with the ESRI format and click Save. Um, and then I click uh, Run on this tool. So now it's doing the calculation precipitation minus runoff, and we've got a set of values. So we might uh, decide to, to look at them. So I can click here, and I can see I've got a runoff of, of 1.8. I'd have to actually remember what the precipitation and the infiltration was to know if that's right. Or I can help myself out by... Uh, where is it um, that I, some way I get to set that I can show all of these things. And I knew how to do that yesterday. Um, I believe uh, if, I, if I, so if I go back to this explore tool here, you'll see it's set to show information on the topmost layer. If I set it to show, say, all visible layers, now, a layer is visible if this checkbox is checked. So now when I click, it's going to show all three values. So I click there, and now I can actually um, expand, and I can see I'm getting infiltration of 2.2. Oh, infiltration at that location was 2.2. The precipitation was 4. 4 minus 2.2 is 1.8. So that's great. The system can do arithmetic. Uh, would have I expected anything more or less? Probably not. What if I click over here? Now I'm saying my runoff is 1.8, but precipitation is 4, infiltration is 2.5. 4 minus 2.5 is 1.5. How much did I pay for the software? Uh, what's going on? Uh, so, uh, here you have to be a, here, here, here it's perhaps not giving the, the intended answer. And if you were examining results here, you would uh, say perhaps something's going wrong. And the reason for that is that uh, the runoff grid was at that scale. Um, the, I mean, the precipitation grid was at that scale. The infiltration was at that scale. And we were inside this middle cell rather than the outside cell. And it actually did the calculation for the bigger cell using only that, that outside cell. So I'll go back to uh, the slides and show you um, what actually happened. Um, so we did the calculation for station minus infiltration. Uh, the, these are the numerical values. And I'm asking the question, how were they obtained? And uh, it turns out um, it used an approach of nearest neighbor resampling. When we were doing the value of 4, it took this value of 4, put it at that center cell. And uh, it's do the nearest neighbor to that 4 is this sort of 2.2 value. So it's doing 4 minus 2.2 is 1.8. And it's giving that result over that entire cell. Uh, for this one, it's doing 
this 6 minus that value of 4, and it's applying it over that whole cell. So it's effectively only using four of the um, infiltration cells, and it's not uh, using the, the other ones in the middle. And that's because it's doing the calculation at a 150-meter scale rather than a 100-meter scale. So uh, maybe that's not what you want. So one of the reasons for actually dwelling on this a little bit is to get you to think about what it's actually doing, and is that what you want it to be doing in terms of this calculation. Um, so there is a right way to do that. I guess I have some animations explaining these calculations. Um, the first thing uh, we've got is that ArcGIS has used the nearest neighbors to align the cells. It's done a raster computation at the scale of the coarsest input. Is that what we want? How are we going to control the scale? And what is actually meant by scale in this context? So I'm going to introduce an idea that comes from some work of uh, Gunter Bloschel um, of the scaling triplet. When you're thinking about data, and this applies to data um, over space or in time, it might have an extent that expresses the full length of the dimension or the area over which that data exists. So from the first value to the last value, or from the east side to the west side. So when we were dealing with Texas uh, evaporation in the very first uh, exercise, the extent was effectively Texas or a little bit inside Texas because you had the furthest east evaporation station, furthest west evaporation station, and you had some idea of evaporation over that space. We could learn about evaporation in Texas from that data. To learn about evaporation in Utah would have been a drastic extrapolation and would have given a poor result. Um, there's also the spacing, which is how far apart the, the information is. Um, and that uh, relates to how reliable any information that you uh, want to sort of infer between the values is. And then there's the support, which is what is the um, area or the footprint or the duration and time for which that uh, quantity applies. If we were thinking of evaporation measured at a pan, well, that's probably quite representative of the areas immediately adjacent, and the pan near Lake Travis is probably representative of the evaporation of Lake Travis. But the further and further you get away, the less representative it is. So you think of the footprint as uh, some measure of that uh, representation. Uh, and that's referred to as the support. So really there's the triple, triplet or three things, extent, spacing, and support that, are, that matter when we're dealing with, uh, with information. And here are a couple of examples that just reinforce why it's important to think about this. Maybe you've got real data that's following this high frequency uh, curve here, but if you're sampling it with a spacing that misses the peaks and the valleys, you're going to get a different fluctuating uh, function um, that's not really showing you what's, what's going on. Uh, if you've got something that's cyclical, but you have an extent that is all on the, on the one downhill thing, you might end up saying this is a, this is a trend. Um, so you wouldn't get the seasonal cycle. If I was in Utah for six months, and I arrived here in July, and I went through to December, and I looked at the temperatures, I would say, wow, this is a place that's just getting colder and colder and colder. And uh, if that was all the data I had, I would think I'm heading for uh, some real cold place. But uh, if I was to wait a year and capture the full cycle, um, so uh, I would learn that it's really some sort of a seasonal cycle. So um, the extent uh, you can, you can miss, you can interpret things wrongly if you don't have a large enough extent. And then in terms of support, the sort of footprint of you averaging over the size of this box, you get a value that's different than the, um, than the signal, and you may also end up with some sort of a smoothing, smoothing out. So what does that mean in terms of uh, the calculation we just did? Um, we did a calculation that uh, the extent was, uh, well, the spacing in the one data set was 100, the spacing in the other data set was 150, and uh, ArcGIS assumed 
the quarter of those for doing its calculation, interpolated everything to 150, and just uh, did the calculation. There is actually a function resample in ArcGIS that we could use to get an appropriate uh, cell size. So we could resample our precipitation data down to, say, 100 meters um, and uh, control the su support and spacing. And we want to have a technique for doing that, perhaps a bilinear method. And then we could get the sort of answer we want. So if I go back here to ArcGIS, let me find. I said that that uh, tool was resample. So let me open another tool and find resample. And uh, so there's the resample data management tool. Um, and I'm going to choose my input raster to be uh, the precipitation because that's at 150 meter cell size. You notice when I fill that in, um, it automatically says the cell size there is 150. My output raster, I'm going to name it uh, precip 100. And um, I'm going to specify the cell size not to be 150, but to be 100. And I could do that by typing these numbers here. But I'm actually going to go and select from the other data sets and say I want it to be the same as infiltration. Because often you want these things to be the, the same. So now it's, uh, it switched those numbers to 100. And here it gives me an option for the resampling technique. It could use uh, the nearest uh, cell resampling approach. Um, that's probably a good approach if I was looking at something like uh, vegetation classes that are integer valued, um, where the, or the integers represent a class, because then you averaging it does not make any sense. Uh, you don't go from one class, number one represents grass, number two represents trees. Well, what does 1.5 represent? Uh, half grass, half trees. Um, so, uh, but if it's a quantity like precipitation that's real valued, I, I may want to use some sort of other interpolation. There's options here, bilinear cubic majority. Bilinear basically fits a linear function in the x direction, a linear function in the y direction, and does a sort of smooth surface interpolation. So I'm going to use that. And I'm going to run this function. So, uh, now that that's done, I see that it's uh, done my resample, completed successfully. The precipitation grid that I'm now dealing with, let me uh, um, change the color scheme. Uh, and uh, here, I've, if I start looking at the individual values, precipitation value four, five, six, Six if I click there. So you might remember that there was, it was just a 4 and a 6. So the 5 has been linearly interpolated. This middle value here is 4.275, which is the sort of average of all of the four for grid cells. So this is where the precipitation interpolation is coming. So now I can go and do my uh, runoff calculation. So I'm going to click over here. Um, and go, how do I get back to my tools? Oh, no, I'm in symbology. I have to go back to geoprocessing. Now, here's a cool thing I discovered yesterday that's actually new with the software this year. You might have noticed that with this little thing here that these numbers, they actually take you back to previous tools that you've run. So if I click on that, I could open another tool which would allow me to discover it, but I can maybe just go back to raster calculator as I had done it before. And here I've already got my raster calculation that I did previously. So if you want to repeat things, that's a handy new feature. Probably introducing new features to you guys is not that exciting because it's all new, but for us, uh, new. Um, so I'm now going to do this calculation uh, with the new value of precipitation. So I'll delete the old one and say precip 100 minus infiltration, 
and I'm going to give the output a new name. Rod, you, you notice it gives this little warning here, and that's because a result already exists, and we don't want to overwrite. What's warning you that if you recalculate it, you'll be overwriting. I'm going to name that runoff 100, and uh, now I'm going to run it. And now we get a calculation um, that's on a 3x3 three three cell size, and uh, let's start clicking on the values. And you see now with my new precipitation infiltration runoff, I'm getting 1.8. If I go there, 3, 5, runoff is 2 here, 4.75 minus 2.5 is 1.775. So you'll notice that no matter where you click in this case, the model is behaving as you expected because we had resampled and got the data consistent. So um, I guess I'm suggesting with this that uh, it's important to pay attention to the cell sizes and what calculations are happening if you want to get the sort of behavior that you expect um, all the time. Um, so let's go back to the slides. So I had, that was what I did. So this was the calculation with the consistent cell size. And this is showing that it's doing all of the nine calculations uh, for all each set of, uh, or each pair of nine cells. Any questions about that so far? Okay, there's a question on the previous slide. Two, two back. 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 Yeah. Here. One more back. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so the so. Paris says he doesn't understand this extent spacing support thing. Okay, so um, if you've got a data set, extent is the um, total uh, length uh, that sort of spans the data. So okay. um, if I've measured, um, measured quantities, say, over, over a time from a year ago today, the extent of the data would be uh, one year. Maybe I'm measuring data daily. Uh, let, let's, let's say, for example, um, I go and measure temperature um, at 8 o'clock in the morning. Uh, I look out my front door, look at my outside temperature. I measure the temperature, and I do it every day for a year. The extent would be... Uh, one year, I would hand, end up with 365 values. The spacing would be one day. I'm recording the temperature every day. The support, I'm looking at what the thermometer says uh, instantaneously. So that's maybe the temperature averaged over however long it takes the thermometer to adjust. So perhaps one minute. So the support would be one minute. If I was to go Later in the day, I would get a different number. So the support is not the whole day. It's just the um, duration for which that measurement is directly applicable. The spacing is how far apart they are, and the extent is the full, uh, um, the full span that that covers. You're OK? Good. OK. Very good. So let, let me add a little piece here. So, and when you're thinking of things in terms of time, instead of saying extent, we say horizon. What's the time horizon? What's the duration of the data? And the spacing is how frequently are we making measurements, like we're measuring five-minute data, let's say. And the support means over what interval of time does the number that I get represent the physical phenomenon. So for precipitation, for example, every five minutes, we're actually measuring the total amount of rain that happened over that five-minute interval. For flow for discharge, we actually measure instantaneously what is happening at this moment. So the same as with temperature, flow has an instantaneous support, so those little circles go to darts, whereas for precipitation, they actually the spacing and the support have the same length uh, associated with them. I have a question on yes. That. Did you have a question on yes. this? Uh, can you please go to 
Me? Why don't you say your question? Okay. Um, so my question so is... How did the... How did the GIS calculate uh, the average linear is per column or is by row? Um, so the question I got here was how uh, is the GIS calculating an average? Is it by column or by row? There, there isn't actually any averaging involved. It's it's doing it. It's a it's a cell by cell calculation. This four minus that 2.2 is giving me that 1.8. No, no, to find the, the middle cell. We have 4 and the 6. Full, so how, how did it get to 5? Uh, it was using bilinear interpolation. So that was where I picked the method here to be bilinear in the tool. The value of 4 here, the value of 6 there, it drew a straight line from that 4 to the 6 and fitted a... Um, fitted a line in the x direction, there's actually no y direction in interpolation required for this cell, so the average of uh, 4 and 6, or if you draw a line from 4 to 6, 5 is the middle value. So how about the, the middle row? Because we can get for the middle column or middle row. This one, it's actually fit a, fit a line from the 4 to the 3.1, it's fit a line from the 6 to the 4, and it's fit a line from 3.1 to 4 and 4 to 6. And it's got those lines sort of going in both directions. And you've got some sort of a distorted surface uh, that, um, is represent that's, uh, that's represented by the equation of a linear equation in the x direction, a linear equation in the y direction multiplied together. And it's picked the value from that surface at, the, at that center location. Yes, do you have another question? Maybe we should... Uh, well, uh, there, there will be help information about the bilinear, so we could go. Um, so uh, let's use this little handy thing that I found and go to resample. And uh, if I look at the help about it, I get... Um, yeah, it explains, performs a bilinear interpolation <laughs> determines. That doesn't tell me a whole lot. Yeah. Uh, but maybe I could uh, go and find, read more and learn about uh, what it actually means. Well, um, the way I think about it is, I just think it, it, there's a, uh, the, as Dr. Pavan was saying, there's lines along the corners of the box and they connect the points. And then at any intermediate point, like the one in the middle, you're taking the location on the left and right along the line and on the top and bottom along the line and then interpolating between those and that's how you get intermediate values. But it, the, the key idea is that you've got uh, essentially a, a l lines along between the points and that can produce a sort of distorted surface in the middle yeah. because it's not it's not planar anymore. Plane, yeah, 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 it's a, it's a kind of curved surface so it, it's easy to understand what's happening along the edges but in the middle it's a bit more uh, flaky to yeah, understand what's happening. But it's a kind of a cool technique, actually, easy to understand. So we could maybe find more information and help if we took more time. Um, that sounds like a great idea for homework. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Is there any uh, any other was there any other questions? Is there another question or down there? Uh, yeah, I have a question. Uh -huh. um, I have a question about um, the slide that. Adas was asking about slide 31, that's a, the scale triplet. Okay. It's pretty far back. Back there? Yes. Okay, so are these only, um, the extent the spacing of the sport, are those only descriptions of your uh, dependent variable or your sampling technique? Like if you were taking uh, precipitation data, the actual value of precipitation would take, like that would not take into account any of these things. Or these things would not take into account. Your precipitation. So, uh, so yes, yeah, so that uh, they apply to the, um, the they apply to the space over which you are trying to quantify the variable. There is also the dimension of precipitation, which may have a value of uh, say 25 inches if you're dealing with precipitation from a hurricane, um, and uh, there's also uh, 
quantities such as the units associated with that, the precision with which that's involved, so it's 25 plus or minus uh, 5, whatever the uncertainty is. So that would be more in the sort of variable dimension of that quantity rather than the uh, independent variable or the space over which it's sampled. So there's more to quantifying uh, data values than, than just this. And in fact, there's a, an awful lot to quantifying data values. Um, and uh, when we were developing the hydrologic information system, we had to think about that. And uh, we came up with that every single data value needs to be quantified in terms of the variable, which has to uh, keep track of its, its units, uh, its location, uh, things like its support, things like its error. Um, and I'm not remembering all the details right now, but there's a lot of information that you have to yeah. keep track of to know what a quantity means uh, unambiguously. Yeah, one of, the, one of the difficulties is that um, in databases, the uh, time is always quantified at the beginning of an interval. So, for example, if you've got annual data, the actual time that's, that it's associated with it is the instant that the year begins. If you've got monthly data, it means the instant that the month began. Daily data is the instant that the day began. That sense of it always being at the beginning is how database, all databases work that way. But there are some variables in hydrology, like rainfall, you really don't know what you've got until you've got to the end. So at the beginning, you don't know anything, actually. So it's a bit of a, you have to really think carefully about what you mean when you say, oh, the rain rainfall at 4 o'clock is this value. Well, yes, that means the rainfall over the last five minutes or the last hour is up to 4 o'clock. Uh, so this, the conventions that are inside databases affect how this happens, too. Um, and so... Traditionally in meteorology, all the data are defined looking forward. But in hydrology, we have to say, oh, sometimes we have to look back before we really know what we've got. And uh, yeah, it's a complicated question. I thought about this for about five years. I read a book with a couple of other people applied hydrology, and I thought about this for about five years. And I couldn't understand how rainfall and flow, because that's we're trying to do mass balances with rainfall and flow, and no, rainfall is only defined over an interval, and flow is defined at an instantaneous point in time. Uh, how do you get that? You know, you, you, when, if you've got everything in continuous time, it's, it's fine. Differential equations, no problem. As soon as you go to discrete time, oh no, now it's not so simple. And finally, I reached the conclusion that those two quantities are irreconcilable once you get to discrete data, even though they're so fundamental to hydrology. Because rainfall is defined over an interval and flow is defined instantaneously, there's always an approximation involved when you compare rainfall with flow. Can't, can never be exactly connected up. So anyway, that's what faculty members are thinking about, you know, when they're sitting in their offices <laughs> doing nothing, yeah. <laughs> thinking about that kind of thing for five years, yeah. No, I really, I really did think about it for five years. <laughs> okay, so... Um, these questions actually lead quite nicely into, uh, into this slide because there's a concept of uh, interpolation. Um, so uh, we were dealing with that grid and we were estimating values uh, between uh, known values. So um, you might have these red dots that are sort of uh, big and they may be irregular and you may want values on a regular grid, so um, they, uh, they're smaller, and there's a number of ways you can do it. You might use the nearest neighbor approach. You might use inverse distance weight. You'll see that uh, come up in uh, ArcGIS quite a lot, where you basically weight the value based on how near the values are. This is the formula actually involved in the bilinear interpolation, where you effectively fit the A, B, C, and D based on the individual points. You might use uh, fancy statistical techniques, such as creeging, which is a sort of uh, unbiased uh, linear estimator, or you might uh, fit the spline type function. Um, so I've got a couple of slides here from another book with, uh, with Gunter Bloschel and the first author, and that is Grayson. Where he looked at interpolation in uh, here, reducing it to one dimension to think of it uh, in a simple way. And if you can think of the, the black dots representing the data points, and 
if you're doing nearest neighbor interpolation, you go into any sort of point on the x-axis, and you're finding the nearest point. So you get a sort of stair-step effect where the stair is halfway between the two points. Um, if you go with, uh, and that's, that's what is actually used by the Thiessen method that we'll uh, talk about later. If you're using the inverse distance squared, sometimes you get a function that looks uh, like that. And it goes exactly through each point, but as you go further away, it could actually dip down because this point here is going to be receiving some weight from these lower points as well as these two. Maybe you would say logically you just want to do a straight line between them. So here are some of the other examples. You could fit, uh, um, you could fit a polynomial and you say, I'm going to fit a higher order polynomial. That's going to be nice and exact. But it could go through the points, but it could get wild in between. Or you could uh, use creeging as what this results in, and then the last one is a, a different set of creeging parameters. Um, so that book is actually available, the whole thing, online. So, and I've got that information from chapter two. Um, so now we're going to work, I'm going to have to go somewhat quickly and perhaps we'll uh, not uh, finish everything and cover some of it later. Um, we're going to talk about uh, digital elevation models uh, and representing the terrain surface and things like slope. So this is what a digital elevation model actually is gridded data um, that represents the topography <coughs> of the surface. And I like to use this picture because it's uh, really attractive. Um, came from a person with, working with LIDAR at, at UT Austin. Um, but when you're thinking about slope, um, some of you will be familiar with uh, the concepts involved in contour mapping, where a contour is a, a line of constant uh, elevation. And if you've hiked with the USGS topo map, you've perhaps tried to navigate with that. Um, and then uh, the slope of the surface might be represented by how close together the contours are. And if you look at the downhill direction, you'll see that it's uh, perpendicular to the contours. Now, see, that line got a little bit distorted somewhere along the, along the way, so it's not exactly perpendicular, but it should be. Um, how are we going to represent that uh, mathematically? There's a a number of options. One would be to say, given the surface z, x, y, so function z is evaluated anywhere, you could evaluate the derivative in the x direction, the derivative in the y direction, and uh, this upside down triangle or del is sometimes referred to as the gradient of that function. And now you've got a, a vector representation of the slope. That could actually map onto this slope that is a vector with x and y components, and the x component would be dz by dx, the y component would be dz by dy. You might choose to represent that vector rather than in terms of an x and y component, in terms of its actual magnitude and direction. We often think of a vector as, in a sort of calculus sense, as a quantity with magnitude and direction. In this case, the magnitude is the slope, the direction is the aspect, and uh, so we'd have a slope and aspect. And there's more details on that in the, in the handout. So um, if you calculate slope uh, in ArcGIS, there's actually a function you can just say calculate slope. It will evaluate it in terms of this uh, rise over run concept. It will look at uh, the change in elevation, the change in horizontal distance, use trigonometry to figure out that angle, uh, the tangent is equal to the rise over the run, and express the answer either in degrees or um, in the uh, decimal value of rise over run, depending on the option that you choose. Um, uh, you also uh, will try and measure the direction of the slope with the aspect, and that's by convention, uh, at least in terms of the ArcGIS slope function, clockwise from north. So. Uh, if you've got this angle, it's representing the direction. You've got the x component, the y component, and you can figure that out from trigonometry as well. So the, the way the, the ArcGIS slope tool works, you can think of we're trying to evaluate the slope at this grid cell E, 
And there's that elevation value there, as well as all of the elevation values of surrounding grid cells. It takes a number of uh, finite difference approximations. It takes a finite difference approximation um, sort of along the middle row, so you'd say the D elevation value minus the F elevation value times 2 delta, because the distance, if delta is a cell size, the distance from D to F is 2 delta. Um, and that's in a finite difference approximation of the slope there. And then it takes the one row up and the one row down. And then it combines all of those together in a sort of weighted average form that's sort of taking this one. It's averaging the, the first two in that expression, averaging the next two in that expression, and then averaging the whole lot in that expression. And if you collapse that down, you get this formula. Um, and you can do the same in the, in the y direction. So you, that's how it evaluates the dzdx and dzdy. And then it'll evaluate the magnitude by basically applying the Pytho Pythagoras theorem, squaring each and summing and taking the, the square root. So um, in terms of evaluating aspects, it's got the dzdy is the y component of the aspect, the z by dx is the x component, and it's using the arctangent function to uh, figure out what the direction of that slope is. You have to be careful when you're doing that because uh, there's an ambiguity when you're taking arctan that's associated with 180 degrees. Is it that way or that way? The tan is the same for those functions. So there's one, one way to resolve it is to use this a special function that uh, many computers implement called ATAN2, and you can express the individual coordinates. Or you have to look at the values, and if they were both positive, it would be this direction. If they're both negative, the ratio is still positive. It's the opposite direction. So if you're doing it on a calculator, you should need to keep your wits about you while you're doing that. So there's an example. So I put numbers for AB. C, D, E, F, G, H, and I, and uh, plug them in and uh, work through the formula and get the x component of slope, get the y component of slope, and then you can evaluate the magnitude of the slope as the square, square root. Um, you can take the arc tangent of that as 21.8, and that'll be the, the slope in a, in a vertical sense from horizontal uh, going down 21.8 degrees, or whatever the radian equivalent of that is, if you're working in radians. Um, in terms of the aspect, we would take uh, the x component and the y component, put them in the ratio, and take the arctangent of it, and we get minus 34.8 degrees in this case. Resolving the ambiguity, the x component is uh, positive, the y component is negative, so it's going to the right and down, so we expect it to be 145, not minus 34.8. So that's where the 145 is, and um, so, so that's the interpretation of that aspect, and the slope is 0.401. So we're going to probably in a homework make you do that by hand, just so that you understand it. Um, similarly, uh, we've got hydrologic slope, which we talk about as the direction of steepest descent. So maybe we have the same numbers here, but we say water flows only from the middle grid cell to one of the neighbors. And we can calculate the slope in each of the eight possible directions, from 67 to 56 to 63 to 74. And we have to evaluate, we have to recognize that on the diagonal direction, the distance you're working over is longer. So it's 67 minus 48 divided by 30 root 2. My cell size is 30. We get a slope of 0.45. In this case, 67 minus 52 gives a larger value. So we would say that the slope, the hydrogic uh, or single direction slope is 0.5, and the direction is downwards. And we have an encoding for um, representing that downward direction. Um, so the, the encoding is, is shown here, 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, and so on. 
Um, there's a limitation in that you've only got eight directions possible there, but maybe the water doesn't uh, go in only one of those directions. It splits the difference. So that got me thinking back in uh, the 1990s uh, about how to represent uh, flow that uh, would perhaps get proportion between downslope neighbors and better represent uh, perpendicular to contours. So I ended up publishing this paper on the D-infinity algorithm, which really takes the sort of three points surrounding uh, any of these triangles, evaluates the steepest slope on any one of them, and then picks the steepest of all of those triangles, and uh, then uses that as the slope. And it reports the slope, it reports the flow direction, and I happen to choose counterclockwise from east. Um, and then when it's doing uh, calculating of uh, the contribution, it does proportioning based on angles. So here's a, a bit of the equations involved in that. So I focused on this first triangle. And the angles you can evaluate based on uh, the z values at the different locations. You can evaluate the slope using that. Um, and then there's a rule that if the angle doesn't fit within the chosen edge, you might, you, you might need to look at another, um, another triangle. So there was an example, and pointing out uh, here that uh, ArcGIS has now implemented this, uh, this method, so we'll be able to get the results from ArcGIS. So when you do the exercise, I'll have you do it by hand and verify that ArcGIS gets the right answer. Um, so uh, Here's, here I put these numbers on, and I just picked on this triangle here. I evaluated that angle, alpha, 14.9. I evaluated the slope, 0.517. So the 14.9 is actually relative to that triangle. The actual um, direction represented as uh, relative to east is this 284.9. Um, so if you want to test this out in ArcGIS, you could actually right now go and take these numbers, put them in a, in a little file similar to the precipitation infiltration files we got, bring that into uh, ArcGIS and see what, it, uh, see what it does. So a couple of summary points. Uh, we covered grid raster data structures uh, that represent surfaces as an array of grid cells. We saw that um, Raster calculation involves algebraic-like operations on grids. Uh, things like precipitation minus infiltration is the runoff. There's often an inherent interpolation or generalization. We're approximating quantities that may be continuous or may be evaluated at each point using a finite uh, cell size. We're uh, using various functions, bilinear, nearest neighbor, to uh, come up with the values um, at each grid cell. So um, you're approximating the data, and the coarser the grid, the sort of worse the approximation. Um, the elevation surface is represented by a grid digital elevation model used to derive slope, which is important for surface flow. I mean, I sometimes joke with people and say, in hydrology, you need to know two things. Water flows downhill. Well, where is this downhill? Uh, and when it gets deeper, it flows faster. So um, here we're trying to figure out what, what downhill actually is. And there's the eight direction pore point model approximates the surface as going in one of the eight grid directions. Uh, the D infinity vector surface flow model approximates the surface as a vector from each grid cell, a portion between uh, downslope grid cells. So any questions? I think we can declare victory here, David. Declare victory on that one. And uh, so uh, next class on Tuesday, we'll uh, have an exercise where we do some of this to learn how to do some of the geoprocessing and model builder. And we'll also look at uh, precipitation over watershed and use some of the averaging methods to get uh, watershed average precipitation and also sub-watershed average precipitation using body Okay, thank you so much.
Like, really wanted to.